Luke chapter 11, verses 17 through 23. <clears throat> this is set in the uh, context of a, a broader uh, portion related to um, Jesus casting the demon out of a mute man and the reaction of the crowd against that, which is unbelief and demanding a sign. And these verses deal with this unbelief of the crowd there. <clears throat> It begins like this, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, just want to appreciate for a moment that Jesus knew their thoughts. <laughs> That's a big deal. The things that had been said in the verses prior to this, uh, 14 through 16, they were said in the mind. They were said in the heart. They were not uttered out loud. And yet Jesus responds to it all the same. And he says to them, any kingdom divided among, sorry, against itself will be ruined, and a house divided itself will fall. So all that Jesus does here <clears throat> is provide a simple truth, right? So if we're just kind of understanding, we're given truth one. Any kingdom divided against itself, right? So keyword here being against, it's divided against itself. If that happens, it will be ruined, right? And so what we're getting is um, uh, like an if-then statement, right? We have this first condition, a kingdom divided itself, and then the result, it will be ruined, right? And the same thing follows, and a house divided against itself, again, keyword against itself here, will fall. So we have a little promise here. It will be ruined. It will fall. <clears throat> that simple truth that any kingdom that's dealing with infighting will fall is relevant because, and we'll see in this next sentence, of what the accusations, the unbelief accusations were here in a little bit. <clears throat> if Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? <clears throat> How can his kingdom stand? So we have an if then here. If Satan's kingdom is divided against himself, then, right? How can his kingdom stand? Jesus' point is quite simple. Uh, kingdoms that are divided against themselves, they don't wage war. When a country is engaged in a bunch of Civil war, it's not fighting wars with other nations. So Satan is saying, Jesus' point is if, if Beelzebub, right? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub, right? He gives us his reason. I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. And, and thus we get the unbelief of the prior verses. They saw Jesus cast out a demon. They don't want to believe that he's from the Lord. So, or from heaven, from God. So they, they attribute him to hell. They attribute him to Beelzebub, who is the prince of demons. And Jesus' point is, if Satan has this kingdom where Satan and Beelzebub are now in a war with one another, then how can his kingdom stand? In other words, why are there so many demon-possessed people in Israel if Satan is divided against himself? If there's a civil war going on in hell, then there's not going to be any demonic activity up here. The abundance of demonic activity proves that king, at least Satan's kingdom is all working together against God and his kingdom. And he says, I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. So Jesus is actually dealing with the unbelief of these crowds by showing their foolishness. These people are beginning to cling to just absolutely foolish explanations for what they're seeing in order to avoid believing that Jesus is the Messiah. <clears throat> so Jesus is, here's, here is uh, truth number one, and here is the logical outcome, right? And now he brings the second one. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, here's his second one. Truth number two and outcome two. Whoops. Truth two and outcome two. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, 
by whom do your followers drive them out? So this, this question cuts a couple ways. Number one, it cuts, um, you know, if, if I'm driving out demons by Beelzebul, if that's how this is done, who do your followers drive them out by, right? And, and obviously they would say, well, our, our followers draw, drive them out by the power of God, right? That's the, the kind of the natural and um, assumed response to this. And so Jesus just immediately jumps on that. So then they will be your judges, <laughs> which is just so good. He's like, all right, go to your own exorcists. Who do they drive out demons by? Your, your own exorcists. Let them be the judge. Let them examine this and let them say whether this is of God or of Satan. Ask them, hey, do demons drive out other demons? Let them be your judges, right? Your own followers are going to be your judges, right? Because again, they've, they've, uh, they've attended now to this idea that is just so utterly foolish. And then Jesus gives the final outcome here. Oh, that's outcome two. This would be outcome three. But if I drive out demons, and this is super important, by the finger of God, by the finger of God, the reason that's important is, well, a couple reasons. Let me get back to it. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So then we have another if then scenario here but if i drive out kingdom demons by the finger of god then the kingdom of god has come upon you okay what is jesus saying well first he's saying that he drives out demons by the finger of god so it doesn't it's not taking a bunch of power to do what jesus is doing it's just the little finger right of god and yet it is so overwhelmingly powerful overwhelmingly powerful over the enemy so this is a statement about god's power it doesn't take a bunch of effort it just takes his finger now the other thing that you would maybe remember is that back in the exodus when uh during the plague of the gnats the um, magicians of pharaoh are unable to produce gnats and they tell pharaoh this is the finger of God. Um, from the mouth of Pharaoh's own magicians, they recognize that this is just a little bit of God's power, but it's not man, right? So when Jesus is doing this, he's saying even the, even the uh, magicians of Pharaoh understood when they were dealing with Moses, who they were dealing with. And the kingdom of God, right, was coming upon Pharaoh. And so Jesus is making a parallel to himself. He's like, I'm driving out demons. I'm doing greater things than that. So I'm driving out demons by the finger of God. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Right, that's the third outcome, right? So what they need to realize is that their unbelief is against the kingdom of God. Their foolishness here is against the kingdom of God. Sometimes when you're dealing with unbelief, you keep kindly bringing them along other times when you're dealing with unbelief, you drop a bomb of truth and you hope that they wake up, right? Jesus is going with that second one. He is dropping just truth bombs on these people, dealing with their thoughts even, not even their words. All right, let's keep going. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which that man trusted and divides up his plunder. So if we're seeing a parallel, which we, we should, we should kind of understand that this section flows as an example from the previous verses that also is going to build onto the final um, outcome, if you will, down here. Um, or you could say maybe inference, or you could even say application. Probably application would be the best. Okay. So here's the example, first part of the example. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. Really simple. When this happens, then his possessions are safe. When this happens, then this happens. But 
all it takes to disrupt that is someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, right? So this guy's feeling good. He's feeling strong. He's feeling fully armed. He's guarding. He feels like his possessions are safe. Then someone stronger comes and that stronger person attacks and overpowers, takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Now, the temptation here is to overly apply this to Jesus. So we have to always be careful whenever we're given like analogies in scripture that we don't kind of overly apply the analogy. This is an analogy, not a metaphor. So the strong man fully armed guarding his own house, this would, this would be representative of Satan and demons and their possession of a person. And they think that they're safe. They think that they're good to go. But then Jesus shows up, the finger of God shows up and attacks and overpowers this, this, uh, this strong man, this strong man here, this, this strong man thinks that they've got it covered, but, but Jesus shows up and by the finger of God just attacks and overpowers that one. He takes away the armor in which the man trusted. Now, this is where we have to not overly apply. Because you can be like, well, what's the armor and what's the plunder? And that's really not the point of this analogy. So we don't want to overly emphasize those things. But the, the point here is that there is a, just an overwhelming victory. Overwhelming victory of Jesus over the enemy. Back again to the finger of God. Therefore... If we're thinking about spiritual warfare and all of these things and the kingdom of God coming upon us, here's the big application of the whole thing. Here's the big therefore. Here's the big outcome. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Anyone not with me is against me. Whoever is not gathered with me scatters. The reason that this is an important voice, first verse to us to remember is that Jesus in this scenario, uh, he is casting out a demon. He is casting out a demon. And if you will not see that and, and come with Jesus, if you remain in unbelief, right, then you are against him. You're against him. And, and if you do that, if you do not gather, gather with me, the one who is casting out demons by the finger of God, the one who is the stronger one who will attack and overpower the enemy, if you don't gather with him, then you will be scattered. Because that's what he does, right? Dividing up the plunder, the scattering here. And so it's just a, a really powerful text that reminds us of the overwhelming, overwhelming power of our God. It's one of those things that we need to be reminded of from time to time because it does a couple things. One, it challenges our unbelief, right? And it strengthens that, strengthens our faith. It reminds us that we're safe, right? That Satan is nothing against God Almighty. But, but lastly, it just reminds us how powerful God is, which puts us into a, a state of worship, awe, and humility. And we need much more of that in our lives. We want to be recognizing who God is so that we are eager to be with him, not against him. So wonderful text. And as Jesus conquers this enemy uh, and this demon, he then deals with his opposition, the Pharisees, and in so doing, reminds us all that we want to be uh, near him as much as we can be.